Ne, ja ne govorim po srpski, ali uh, jaz sem uh, um, vseoma, vseoma srečen, da budem, da budem s, s, s vama uh, in medžu, medžu vama. Bravo! <laughs> Dobro večer svima. Velika mi je čast i zadovoljstvo što mogu večeras da razgovaram sa gospodinom Bruno Monsaže. Monsaže, right? Koji je započeo karijeru kao violinista, ali poslednjih 30 godina se prvenstveno bavi snimanjem dokumentarnih filmovima posvećenim nekim od najvećih muzičara današnjice. I drago mi je što ćemo posle ovog našeg razgovora imati prilike da u ovoj bioskopskoj sali pogledamo njegov film snimljen sredinom 90-ih koji je posvećen velikom uh, jevrejsko-britansko-američkom violinisti Jehudi Menjuhinu i film se zove Violina Beka. Gde, dakle, Jehudi se posmatra kao najveći violinista 20. veka. Ja ću vam sada samo najpre izdvojiti nekoliko najzanimljivijih momenata iz vrlo bogate i vrlo impresivne biografije gospodina Monsežona. Dakle, on je da, pariski koncertni violinista koji se dakle, veoma uspešno bavi i snimanjem dokumentarnih filmova po muzičarima. Snimio je filmove o nekima od najvećih muzičara današnjice kao što su Nadja Boulanger, Jehudi Menjuhin, Marej Peraja, Glenn Gould, Sviatoslav Richter, Viktorija Postnikova, Genadi Roždistvenski, Michael Tilson Thomas, Zoltan Kočiš, Friedrich Gulda, Porto Lerje, Julius Kačin, Dietrich Fischer Diskau, David Dojstra, Julia Varadi, znači bukvalno who is who od svetskih muzičara. I takođe on je bio jedan od prvih reditelja koji je otkrio mladog Valerija Sokolova, gosta našeg festivala Strings, o kome je snimio prvi film kada je Valeri imao samo 17 godina. I na neki način to je bilo njegovo veliko lansiranje u svet. A, između ostalog, dakle, snimio je nekoliko velikih ciklusa posvećenih Davidu Oistrahu, Glenu Guldu, Minjuhinu samom, zatim Viktoriji Postnikovoj. Osvojio, ja sam tu uspela da prebrojim sigurno oko 50 nagrada za svoje filmove, što je zaista impresivno i što je još važnije uspoje da dođe do ekskluzivnog materijala. Višegodišnjim istraživanjem došao je do materijala za koji se verovalo da je izgubljen ili da ne postoji, uspoje da dođe do tih zvučnih zapisa starih violinista, dakle da nemamo samo sliku već i ton, da zaista čujemo kako su oni svirali kada su bili na vrhuncu svojih snaga i moći. Mi ćemo sada voditi razgovor na engleskom jeziku. Ja ću posle svakog odgovora prevesti ukratko šta je gospodin Osinjon rekao i nadam se da ćete uživati. So that was our short introduction and I'm very happy to welcome you here to Leskovac and to the festival Strings. Um, so let's begin with the violin. How did you fall in love with the instrument and how did you begin to play? Oh, well, it was a, a very simple uh, fact that uh, I first heard a, um, a recording of, actually it was Menuhin mm -hmm. playing when he was a young man. I heard him on a record, you know, and he was doing the, he was playing the Hungarian dance in B minor by Brahms, transcribed by Joachim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, also, at that age, I was four or five, I had no beard, but I, 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 I felt that my, my, my hairs, not my hair, but my hairs were going like my, it was a tremendous experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is exactly at that time that I decided I would, I would be a violinist. Okay. Uh, dakle, gospodin, pitala sam ga kako se zaljubio u violinu kao instrument i ko, on kaže da ga je zapravo upravo Menjuhin inspirisao da postane violinista. Slušao je njegov snimak, LP ploču, 
na kojoj on svira Bramsovu mađarsku igru u transkripciji za violinu i to je bilo tako jedno fantastično iskustvo da je tog trenutka odlučio da postane violinista. And then a little later, still connected with the violin, I heard a recording of David Oistrach playing Sherazade by Rimsky Korsak, you know, all the solos. And and then the fourth, the fifth Mozart concerto in A major, you know. And I remember particularly the cadenza at the end of the Joachim cadenza, you know, the violin does something of the kind, and and just that little slide between the the B and the A chord was so striking that the recording got worn out because I would play that constantly all the time, you know, it was so moving. And then, of course, I hope I, I stopped being completely obsessed with the violin to absorb music as such. Dakle, još neka značajna iskustva bile su kada je prvi put čuo Davida Oistraha, kako svira pogotovo u Šeherezadu rimskog Korsakova i peti Mozartov violinski koncert sa kadencom Jozefa Joachima. I kaže da je toliko slušao tu ploču da se ona izlizala od stalnog okretanja. I dakle, to je bila prva ljubav violina, međutim, kasnije je naravno proširio tu svoju ljubav na muziku uopšte. So when you were listening to those LP records as a boy, did you ever dream that you would get a chance to uh, get to know these famous musicians or that you would get a chance to film the movies about them? Well, I, I don't think so, not, not at that age. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, uh, first did of all... Did you dream about meeting them? Yeah, but you see, a, a performer, when one is five, a performer or even a composer, it's not a clear notion. A composer who is writing, is music written, is music composed? I didn't know. It was just the, that extraordinary fact that I heard the violin with such intensity. And I, I wouldn't have thought of, of meeting any of these people. It came a little later, of course, then when I started playing the violin. And I, I, used, I, I used to play the piano before that. And my parents were a bit scared. Mm -hmm. that I was, uh, all my attention was geared towards music. And they were a bit scared about that. But, you know, nevertheless, I, I got a violin finally. And, and, um, and by the time I got a violin, I knew most of the repertoire by, by memory. You know, because I, I bought music scores and everything constantly. I had already an enormous musical library. Oh, fantastic. Dakle, ja sam ga pitala da li je tada kao dečak sa svojih pet, šest godina mogao da pretpostavi da će jednog dana biti u prilici da upozna sve ove velike muzičare. Naravno, kaže da kao tako mali dečak to nije mogao da zna, nije pravio ni razliku između toga šta je kompozitor, šta je izvođač, nije imao svest o tome da se muzika zapisuje, ali je već tada počeo da pravi svoju ogromnu kolekciju ploča. I kaže da je najprej počeo da svira klavir, ali je sve vreme zapravo želeo violinu i u nekom trenutku je prešao na violinu i kaže da je u vreme kada je počeo da svira violinu već gotovo ceo glavni violinski repertoar znao na pamet. Jer je imao već toliko veliku kolekciju i toliko toga je slušao i slušao i slušao i tako je dotle zapamtio svu tu muziku. You have a phenomenal memory. I do. Sorry. So where did you study? Music and who were your teachers? Well, look, the thing was that I, I was allowed to have lessons on the violin. My, I had begged, I wanted a violin. And my parents, when I finally got the violin, my parents said to me, I would not have lessons until I became first at school. Okay. And I was last. Oh. So it took me three months to become first. And That's called motivation. Uh, motivation is very strong. And then I had my first teacher and of course, since uh, when I came to the first lesson, I think I played to her, she, her name was Mademoiselle Carré. And I did, I played to her a Handel Sonata, D major. She taught, taught, you know, and the poem by Chausson, mm -hmm. or part of it rather, because I had a, a violin for three months alone. 
So I was groping my way around. And, but it, you know, since I, I'd gone to many concerts, I had observed violin. So at the, at the beginning, the violin was very natural to me. It was without any problems. Dakle, kada je počeo da uči violinu, roditelji su mu postavili uslov zapravo. Rekli su, tek kada postane najbolji u svom razredu, onda može da počne da uzima časove violine. A on je u tom trenutku bio jedan od najlošijih učenika i trebalo mu je tri meseca, toliko je bio motivisan, da od najgorih džaka postane najbolji. I onda su mu dozvolili da počne da uzima časove violine i kaže da mu je od starta to išlo veoma prirodno, zato što je išao na toliko koncerata i toliko toga slušao, da je onda sasvim prirodno mogao da se snađe na instrumentu. And the, the, the poor Mademoiselle Carré was, uh, could, did not believe. She, she thought I had taken many, you know, I had played violin for quite mm -hmm. a few years. In any case, the great advantage of that wonderful woman was that she had a, a healthy position, you know, everything that she taught was, was of good nature. But also she had two friends, two old maids as well, old maidens, and uh, one was playing the piano, another one was a cellist. And so I started playing trios and all of that immediately. And of course it was no problem because the, the pianist was a big, big lady and she would make an enormous amount of wrong notes, so it didn't bother, you know, but I, I became familiar with the with the music that's interested me. Mm -hmm. Dakle, um, kaže da je jedna od najboljih stvari vezanih za njegovu prvu profesorku violine bila ta što ona imala tu jako prirodnu postavku ruke i što je imala dvoje dobrih prijatelja koji su bili violončelista i pijanist. Tako da su oni, praktično je Bruno od svojih početaka, krenuo da svira i u triju. E sad, nažalost, osoba koja je svirala klavir je puno grešila, nije baš mogla da ubode svaki ton tačan, ali to im nije smetalo. I kaže da je njegova prva profesorka violine zapravo bila šokirana kad je shvatila da je on početnik. Jer je ona mislila da je, samim tim što se tako dobro snalazio na instrumentu, mislila da je on zapravo već uzimao časove, nije mogla da poveruje da je on zaista tu potpuni početnik. And then I entered the conservatoire. Um, and that was a very, very negative experience because the teaching at the conservatoire consisted mainly in the fact that you had to copy all the bowings and all the fingerings of the professor, of her professor. You know. And uh, I didn't like that. I thought that interpretation, if you want to have a personal interpretation, you have to have your own outlook and your own decisions, then you can, you, can dis, you can discuss these options. But I did not want to be taught what to do, mm -hmm. you know. So that was the uh, rather negative experience. Mm -hmm. Dakle, kaže da je zapravo za njega iskustvo studiranja na konzervatorijumu bilo dosta negativno, jer se tada suočio sa tom jednom šablonskom nastavom gde se od učenika očekivalo da moraju da kopiraju prstored, poteze gudalom i sve od svojih profesora. Da rade tačno, identično kako im profesor kaže. Međutim, njegov duh je bio takav da je zahtevao slobodu i on je smatrao da prava interpretacija ne može da se zasniva na tome da vam neko nacrta tačno šta treba i kako da radite. Tako da, eto, to je bilo jedno negativno iskustvo za njega. And so, also in terms of repertoire, you know, I remember one day, monsieur, Maître, as we called him, Renard, imposed on me the fifth concerto by Vieux-Temps. And I was not interested in that kind of music. I really hated it. Mm -hmm. And then something absolutely extraordinary happened. Um, I, Yehudi Menuhin was uh, giving a series of master classes in England, in Dartington. And uh, I came to Dartington and I was allowed in the class. There was a competition, you know, and I was, I was, I was admitted. And, and, well, I will tell you what happened afterwards. Aha. Dobro. Dakle, kaže još jedna stvar koja mu se nije dopadala na konzervatorijumu je to što je morao da uh, svira repertoar koji su mu profesori dali. Čak i ako su to bile kompozicije koje mu se uopšte nisu sviđale. 
Međutim, imao je tu veliku sreću da se desilo da je Minjuhin držao majstorski kurs u Engleskoj, koji je bio vezan za jedno takmičenje, tako da se njemu ukazala prilika da ode tamo i da pohađa u stvari taj kurs i da se prvi put upozna sa Minjuhinom. I sad ćemo čuti šta se onda desilo. And so Yehudi um, was not about fingerings or, you know, he was, he was trying to understand what you wanted to say. He was trying, he was trying to, to make you become you to the fullest, which was an unbelievable experience. I mean, with, the, with the gentleness that was his, you know, he was, and that, that became the beginning of a fantastic friendship. Because right after that, those uh, weeks of master classes, he uh, engaged me to play the Bach double concerto with him. And naturally, you know, playing that uh, wonderful work with this extraordinary violinist made me, uh, still, still today, you know, the, the first impression was so glorious. Um, there, there was one thing which he did in a way that I, I heard no other musician do. You know, he had a very special tone production. His tone was absolutely his own. It was his voice, and which you can recognize in, you know, when he tunes the violin, you know, it's Menuhin mm -hmm. playing. We're going to be able to hear that. You, you will, you will hear it, of course. Yeah. And, and so, the, uh, when you played with him, which happened to me quite a few times, um, you had the impression that he was not saying, look, play with me and, and, uh, and, and imitate or do whatever. No, it was not. He said, what he said to you was, this is not only my sound. My sound is yours. I give it to you. You know, that kind of uh, uh, teaching or approach to music was the most rewarding that one can think of. And now, and, and you know, the beginning of that friendship led to what was to become later uh, 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 quite a monument. Mm -hmm. Dakle, šta se desilo? E, nakon svih ovih dosadnih profesora na konzervatorijumu, Menjuhin je sada Bruno otvorio jedan potpuno novi svet, jer on više nije toliko vodio računa o prstoredu i o tim nekim e, tehničkim stvarima, već je prosto želeo da svaki mladi muzičar iskaže sebe, da postane to što jeste. A s druge strane, pošto je Menjuhin imao taj jedan vrlo specifičan ton, koji ćemo moći da čuvamo posle kad budemo gledali film, on je zapravo rekao, Brunu, evo ti ovaj moj ton. Znači, radio je sa njim na tom kvalitetu tona, na kvalitetu izraza, na tome da dobije prav, pravu svest o tome šta znači biti muzičar i kako sebe izraziti. I ono što je bio, da kažem, početak jednog velikog prijateljstva, koje je kasnije dovelo i do snimanja filmova i tako dalje, rezultovalo je u tome da je Menjuhin pozvao Bruna da zajedno sviraju Bahov dvostruki koncert. Što je, možete misliti, za jednog mladog muzičara bilo potpuno svemirsko iskustvo i nešto što pamti do današnjih dana. Okay, so, because of the time restriction, we're going to skip a few decades and now I'm going to, going to ask you how did you become a filmmaker? Did you discover this gift or interest in making films early on? Or was it a later development? No, it was quite, quite early. Uh, what happened was that I was, um, I, I really felt I wanted to create something. And the act of creation, I was not, I, I used to compose a lot. It was govno, as they say in Russian, absolutely nothing. And uh, uh, then I had the, audacity of making my first television programs, not films, television programs, with Menuhin again, which I did, I did something about Central Europe and the violin. The gypsy phenomenon was the first episode. The second was the Jewish people in the violin. And the third was two great figures, Enesco and Bartok. And we did that, and that program had quite a lot of success. And then I decided, the first thing I wanted to do was to write to Glenn Gould 
whom I had heard in Moscow a few years before. I had met him in Moscow, although he was not present. So the, that was the best part of presence, which was not physical. But I, I bought, I remember I bought the whole shop all the records, because I didn't tell you know what, what happened in Moscow in those days. You, you had to, to, to find, to decipher the most unbelievable scribblings you know, that were not clear. They had few titles, 60 at the most, and I decided to buy the whole thing. Wow. And came back to the uh, dormitory where I was you know, studying for two weeks, and I put on the record, I, I saw, in the pile of recordings that I had bought, I saw at some point Glenn Gould, uh, Concerti Strade, from the uh, concert, uh, li live recording. And um, I, I, knew, I knew his name, but nothing, nothing more. And I put that recording that night, and I heard very clearly the voice, uh, come and follow me. So that was an, an essential, you know, there was my life before Glenn Gould and my life after Glenn Gould. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, dakle, postavila sam pitanje, morali smo, da bismo skratili razgovor, preskočili nekoliko decenije i onda sam ga pitala kako je odlučio da postane reditelj. Uh, kaže da se od, uh, da je zapravo bio motivisan željom da stvara. I mada je pokušao da komponuje, nije zapravo bio zadovoljan svojim kompozicijama, a onda mu se ukazala prilika da počne da snima emisije za televiziju. I to je prva emisija zapravo bila sa samim Menjuhinom. Pored toga imao je posvećene kompozitorima Bartoku, Enesku i tako dalje. I u stvari nakon toga je stekao samo pouzdanje da počne da se bavi i filmom. A kaže također da je jedan od revolucionarnih događaja u njegovom životu bio kada je otkrio interpretacije Glena Gulda. I to se desilo u Moskvi, tako što je negdje kupio nekih 60 ploča na nek, napisanih nekim nerazumljivim fontom, nije ni znao šta je uzvao, ali video je ime Glenn Gould, stavio da sluša tu ploču i tu mu se sada otvorio ponovo potpuno novi univerzum, tako da kaže da deli svoj život na vreme pre i posle otkrića Glena Goulda i on je čak skupio hrabrost da piše Guldu i da stupi u kontakt sa njim zbog potencijalnog snimanja. So, um, then a little later, five years later, I had had an experience in television somehow, because I had played a lot of concertos and sonatas for television, and I observed what they were doing, although it was terribly badly done. You know, television is something which I hate, but it was, it was not done properly, but at least I, I understood that there was a way in, that might, might make a film. And I wrote a letter to Glenn Gould via CBS, New York. And um, the wonderful thing was that six months later, I think I wrote in October and I got his letter in March, the year after. And the letter that he wrote to me was 26 pages long. Wow. <laughs> well, he was a writer. He loved to and, at, and at the end, he said, come and see me to Toronto. Okay. Dakle, posle pet godina, uh, Bruno je napisao pismo Glenu Guldu preko diskografske kuće CBS Europe. Uh, I nakon nekoliko meseci stigao je odgovor od Glena na 26 strana. Uh, pošto je Glen u stvari bio i bavio se i pisanjem i volao čovjek, on je da piše. Dakle, 26 strana dugačko pismo i na kraju je pisalo dođi da me posjetiš u Toronto. So, you know, it would be a very, very long story if I, if I wanted to tell it in details and the details are very amusing usually with Glenn. Mm -hmm. In any case, you know, I, we finally, uh, he reserved a hotel. You know, no one had access to him. You know, he was a completely solitary person. But, you know, with me it was no problem. And finally I, I saw this extraordinary man come to the room where I was in, in, in the hotel which he had reserved for me. 
and he rang the bell at three o'clock in the afternoon and it was a very, very, very hot summer day. He was wearing a big overcoat, scarves, uh, gloves, snow boots, and uh, uh, he looked like a, some kind of, of a ghost. You know? And you know, I opened the door, he came in, got all that stuff off, and we started talking about, straight away, about the, the films that I was thinking about and, and what his reactions might be. And so he came into the room at three o'clock in the afternoon and left at six o'clock the next morning. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and no, no talks about food, about anything except tea. And he managed to, uh, we had managed to have some tea. But the, 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 the conversation which started about Benjamin, whom I'd seen the day before in California, and they had recorded together, Beethoven, uh, Bach and Schoenberg. And so we, we, we had the most wonderful and amusing and, and exhilarating and inspiring conversation for those 12, 15 hours in, in a row. And the next two days were spent visiting various studios, uh, talking about the, the, the whole project. And finally, after three days of that, he, he drove me back to the airport and said, I will feel very comfortable making the films with you. Yeah, so basically that was the audition. He wanted to meet you and to see what uh, well, you connected. It was more than that. He actually, I had to pass a test, mm -hmm. a test of colors. And if I had not succeeded, that would, it wouldn't the, have worked with no, you. And a test which lasted at least 40 minutes, mm -hmm. where he asked me about my favorite colors and the way they would match. And if I had answered things that didn't please him, he would mm -hmm. have said goodbye and that was yeah. the end. Before that, he, he did already have some experience filming for the television in America, right? He, he had was hosting, he was, uh, Glenn, did he have this prior experience before you embarked on filming? Because he was uh, doing some television specials. He had an enormous America. experience in yeah. television. He was like hosting these shows where he also performed, well, but also talked. No, no, he, would, he wouldn't do that. He did that as a joke. But no, he had an enormous experience of television, but that was television. And I think that the reason he accepted me was that I was bringing perhaps him a, a more a broader mm -hmm. a vision of what could be done. That's for sure. Now, the translation, sorry. Dakle, poznanstvo sa Guldom je bilo jedno čudesno iskustvo, prvo zato što je on imao reputaciju da je do njega nemoguće doći i da živi jako povučeno, da je usamljenik, da je tako malo izolovan čovek. Međutim, eto, oni su se pronašli kao srodne duše i istog sekunda uspostavili komunikaciju. Kada je Glenn prvi put došao kod Bruna u hotelsku sobu, kaže, bio je jako topao letnji dan, a ovaj je bio zabundan od glave do pete. Nosio je kaput, šal, kapu, čizme, rukavice, plašio se strašno hladnoći i onda kako je ušao kod njega, onda je počeo da skide sve te slojeve odeći sa sebe i onda su počeli da pričaju i pričali su od tri popodne do šest ujutro, bez zaustavljanja. I nekoliko dana su tako intenzivno razgovarali gde je Bruno između ostalog morao i da položi test razlikovanja boja kod Gulda, dakle, baš ga je onako testirao na različite načine da vidi da li bi mu bio dobar saradnik i na kraju je rekao da, to je to, radit ćemo zajedno. I forgot, I forgot to say that I was treated to a most unbelievable piano recital because he didn't have a piano, but he had, uh, there was a piano uh, which he used for recordings in a gigantic uh, commercial center you know, on the sixth floor. And we went there and we had to take off the, the, uh, the envelope, you know. And he sat at the piano and he played for six hours. Wow. <laughs> there was almost no, nothing written for the piano. He played the entire Elektra by Strauss. Wow. He played to me the Fifth Symphony by Schubert. He played some, um, some uh, Schoenberg leader. And then, uh, what else? It was absolutely unbelievable. All from memory. And uh, of course, well, of course. 
And uh, then he played, no, he played one piano piece, which was the Hindemith Third Sonata. And then uh, he started embarking on Capriccio by Strauss when we had to leave, you know, because we had, we had an appointment somewhere else. But, you know, it was on absolutely staggering to get, he was still in his coat, yeah. you know, sitting like a, like Under the a, piano. a caribou <laughs> and, and uh, the, the most beautiful music and all of that incredible uh, explore, you know, explore, Podvig, yeah, yeah. which was incredible. The perils so, of being a genius. Yeah. Dakle, kada su prvi put otišli u studio gdje je trebalo da se snima i gdje je bio taj neki predivni klavir, dolazi Glenn tako sav zabundan sa onom svojom stoličicom, kako on uvek sajedao ispod klavira, i kaže, seo je za klavir i svirao šest sati bez zaustavljanja. Napamet, i to ne kompozicije pisane za klavir, već Schubertovu petu sonatu, celu elektru Richarda Strausa, Hindemitovu treću sonatu za klavir i tako dalje, Jednostavno, čovjek je bio genije sa svim dobrim i lošim stranama koje to nosi. Ali prema Brunovom iskustvu uglavnom su bile dobre. And so, this was the initial time that I was going to spend 10 years working with him until his very death. The next 10 years were devoted and we managed to make, during that time, uh, four films f first, and then we made three films around Bach, which were called the, the uh, Question of Instrument, and Art of the Fugue, and the Goldberg Variations. These are the three Bach films. We were supposed to make five films on Bach, but he died, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, but look, if we, I'm starting telling you stories about my relationship with Glenn Gould, it might be endless, and uh, so, you will have to write a book to make about that, yes. yeah. or make a film. Yeah. Uh, dakle, prosto previše ima tih anegdota vezanih za Gulda, nećemo ih sada sve slušati, ali eto, znači, on, njihova saradnja je trajala više od deset godina, sve do Guldove smrti, i za to vreme uspeli su najprej da snime četiri filma, nakon toga još tri filma posvećena Bahu, odnosno Guldovim tim čudesnim interpretacijama Baha, i zapravo je bio plan da snime pet filmova, međutim, Gould is preminuo, tako da to nisu uspeli da ostvare. We need to be getting closer to the end of our conversation, yes, yes. but um, your biography, so many impressive names that you have worked with and filmed about, so these people who gave you access to their lives, not just professional lives, but also personal. Um, you got to know them as yeah. human beings, yeah. not just yeah. as these people yeah. On, yeah. on the records and uh, on the stage. So, um, well, who would... you know, it's, it's a difficult question because after all, a film, what I really wanted, a film has to be a drama. It has to have a dramatic structure. You know, Do you film, write a script? One writes, a one writes a scenario, a script, mm -hmm. and it's got to be, you know, it's got, with Glenn, it was essential, you know, it was all, and we talked and talked for months, and, uh, you know, and phoned, uh, used the telephone a lot, and, um, and written form as well. So, but I think this is the essential thing. A film is not a reportage. You know, it's nothing to do with journalistic uh, approach. I, I, a film must be a, a drama, a, a drama which may be amusing, which may have all the colors of drama, but it has to have that, that thread. And this is what I learned little by little, and which I, I hope I've been able to, to uh, uh, make use of uh, when I, you know, when I had those, that enormous, now looking back, you know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. a bit scared. Mm -hmm. I, but it's it's been a very inspiring uh, mm -hmm. thing to do, and still is now because I'm I have, I'm far from having finished. Um, Perfect. Okay. So. Yeah. Dakle, pitala sam ga, odnosno nije čak ni bilo pitanje, s obzirom na to da je snimio toliko filmova sa nekim od najvećih imena 20. i 21. veka, dakle oni su mu dali da pristupi njihovim životima, ne samo profesionalnim, već i privatnim. Sa nekima je postao i prijatelj. 
kako je bilo iskustvo snimanja. Međutim, Bruno kaže da zapravo film da bi bio dobar, dakle film kao mediji, mora da bude drama. Mora da ima nekakav zaplet, mora da ima nekakav rasplet, strukturu filma da bi držao pažnju i da se ne bi pretvorio u puku reportažu, jer to onda nije kvalitet, kvalitetan film. A, tako da u stvari a, on za većinu svojih filmova piše scenario. Pa, dakle, snima se na osnovu scenarija, scenario se razvija u saradnji sa muzičarima, konkretno, kaže opet sa Guldom, da su oni mesecima i mesecima razgovarali oko svakog filma, pripremali taj scenario kako da naprave da taj finalni proizvod bude i zanimljiv gledaocima, da to ne bude samo neka linearna priča. So perhaps, since we're going to see a film, uh, why this particular film? You know, uh, I have made... I think 15 films with Menuhin. This one we chose together with Damian, you know, because I didn't know what, what he might have wanted. And we chose Menuhin simply because I thought it would be fine with this uh, festival. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there are string players and they might be interested in uh, hearing that extraordinary violinist, I mean, in my mind, the greatest who ever lived. And in terms of uh, virtuosity when he was young, and then uh, because of his uh, the great greatest misconception and the fact that he's perhaps the most deeply moving violinist who ever was. And so I know it's a, it's a rather long film because it's, it's telling, it's, it's a kind of retrospective of his life. I mean, his, his life as a musician, basically, you know, I'm not interested in so, so much in biographical elements, um, but also the fact that during those 30 or 40 years that I, no, sorry, 60 years that I have known him. Um, I mean, even more if I count that I started knowing him when, when I was five. So, yeah, with the record. Ever since we first met, uh, 60 years. And um, uh, the, I carried out a gigantic research uh, for documents that I was hoping to find. And so that in the film you will see lots of ancient documents, but also a lot of, of the, my films about him, you know, which I inserted in that particular uh, mm -hmm. film. And, um, and the archival footage that you... I'm sorry? The archival footage that you discovered, you know, uh, archival, old films. Archival yes. footage, of course, but also archival footage from my own films. Yes. You know, because we worked on such a long period of time that it was possible. So this is the reason why Damian and I together decided to show you this film, The Valley in the Century. Ništa, samo kratko objašnjenje zbog čega, smo izab, zbog čega je izabran baš ovaj film koji ćemo sada gledati, Violina Veka. A, dakle, Bruno je snimio oko 15 filmova samo o Menjuhinu. I oni su se poznavali, eto, skoro 60 godina. Zapravo što kaže Bruno još i duže, ako uračuna da je njegov prvi susret sa Menjuhinom bio preko one ploče koju je slušao kad je imao pet godina. A, izabrali su ovaj film zato što on predstavlja neku retrospektivu menjuhinovog profesionalnog života. Dakle, nisu ga toliko interesovali biografski detalji, već upravo ta evolucija menjuhina kao muzičara. I u ovom filmu koristi jako mnogo arhivske dokumentacije. On je, dakle, godinama morao da a, pretražuje kopa, traži materijal. A, dakle, ima jako mnogo tih arhivskih dokumenta, ima jako mnogo arhivskih snimaka, sačuvanih starih filmova, ali tu se zapravo pojavljuju i odlomci iz Brunovih ranijih filmova o Menjuhinu, koji su sada inkorporisani u ovaj jedan malo duži film. A, ja samo da pitam koliko je sati, koliko vremena još imamo? I, th I, thought, I thought that maybe after we see the film, we maybe can... questions, and I, I, yeah. would be, I would be at your disposal if no. you want to, to carry on with yeah. the conversation. I, th I, I don't know. Oh, if you have any questions, of course, I'd be happy mm -hmm. to answer them. But maybe after the film might be more productive. Who knows? I'm going to ask whatever you. you. Whatever you feel like. Da, znači, najbolje da mi sada pogledamo film, pa nakon projekcije filma, ako još neko bude zainteresovan da postavi pitanja ili da razgovara sa Brunom, on je vrlo raspoložen da priča o tome i da i da, i da ga pitate sve što vas bude interesovalo. Tako da, eto, ja se zahvaljujem svima koji su prisutovali. Merci. Hvala. 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 Hvala.